Hi, my name is Steve. I'm the associate at First Baptist Church in Golden, Colorado. There's a question I want to put out there. Do you want to have a good life? Do you have a desire for a good life? Someone once said, I don't really care if I hit excellence. I'd just be happy to plateau at mediocrity. But I think most of us want a good bit more than that. In a recent study done in Millennials, they discovered that 80% of the people in the study saw as their first and greatest ambition to be rich in wealth. Another 50% decided what they wanted was to be famous. But do those things really satisfy? Pick up a tabloid at any grocery store and you can see the wreck of lives that have chased money and fame. There's a unique research study done at Harvard University that's lasted 75 years. It's done by Robert Waldinger, who's the fourth director of that study. It involved 472 men, started in 1938. About half of them were Harvard sophomores, and the other half were young teenage boys from poverty-stricken areas of the Boston community. They followed, they followed these men for now 75 years. You can put this up on YouTube and you'll You'll find this study in Waldinger's explanation of it. Robert Waldinger is the fourth director of this study. They've followed these men over 75 years. 60 of them are left all in their 90s. They followed them to see, ask the question, what makes a good life? What makes you happy? Every two years they would do a questionnaire, they do interviews, they would do physiological studies of their blood work their health records, their brain scans. They would interview their wives. And they'd follow these gentlemen through their lives. Some went from poverty to riches, some just the opposite direction. One was a president of the United States. They've got all sorts of directions and trying to find out what makes a good life. It's probably the most comprehensive study done on happiness in all of history. Their discovery was that none of the things we would see as markers of a good life, a rich life, a well-lived life were found in the study. Not wealth, not accumulation of assets, not impact on the community. Rather, it was the depth of relationships. The men who lived the longest had the deepest relationships. Not just in a couple, but also in their network of people. The colleagues they worked with shifted into kind of retirement playmates and they kept active and busy. People who had a network of friends seemed to fare better even when they were ill. They were happier because they had that person to fall back or that group of people to fall back on. There were couples who kind of fought and argued every day, but when push came to shove, they knew that each other had each other's back. As I think about that study from, the, from Harvard and all that transpired in there and how important it is to have relationships, I'm reminded of a kind of obscure passage in the Old Testament. The end of the book of Judges in the history of Israel was kind of a transformational moment. They had secured the Holy Land. They were secure with all 12 tribes established and building their communities, building their network of relationships. The people looked around and said, well, judges are okay, but we'd really like to have a king. Every other nation around us has a king, and we do not. We'll be better off if we have a king. Well, God cautioned them against that. They went to start that process of, of securing a king and setting him up. It says that after that meeting, the Israelites left that place and went home to their tribes and clans, each to his own inheritance. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as he saw fit. In an older translation, everyone did just as he saw best in his own eyes. The message that I see from that it seems to be like a mirror image of the world that we're living in today. That image would be this. Everybody's doing what's best for them, trying to find the happiness that's best for them. 
hoping to make it all fit together so that they have a good, good life. And it begs the question, is that enough? It's not hard to find unhappy people in any segment of your life. The message of that story in Judges that resonates to me today is about stories. Everybody has a story. Their life is a story. Their past is a story. Their future hopes are a part of their story. And oftentimes we feel like our story is isolated. It's not a part of a bigger story at all. And yet, the thing that God wants most is to make our story a part of his bigger story. It's often been said that the study of history is really just a study of his story working out in the lives of people throughout all time. So how do we get engaged in that story? What would it be like to have a good life in the midst of that story? I think Jesus implemented a process that is unique and often forgotten that can help us find that good life. That story would be this. Jesus didn't build programs. He didn't build a church in the formal sense, the structural sense. He didn't put on seminars. He didn't sell books or tapes. He didn't build an army. He didn't do any of those things. Rather, Jesus gathered a group of disciples, gathered them around him, and he took them through the course of life, interacted with people on the street, interacted with powerful people in government and religion, interacted with military figures, interacted with common men and women everywhere and brought their story into his story, and they were transformed. The vehicle that Jesus used is called discipleship. And I'd like to define that a bit. Discipleship, I think, could be best described as disciplined relationships, or a disciplined fellowship, where we concentrate not so much on a program that we're engaged in, although that program may be helpful, rather we concentrate on a relationship within a program or a relationship with someone near to us. It could be a family member, it could be a colleague, it could be someone that I've just met and established a relationship with. That relationship is, is more like a coach with a willing player. A coach who knows where he wants his team to be, knows how to train them, knows how to build them up, knows how to prepare them for a kind of maximum performance and a player who has the tools and the skills but perhaps not the experience or the situational awareness to pull that off in a larger game set. And then there's the issue of all these players working together to accomplish their part in the larger goal. Discipleship is a lot like that. It's a kind of disciple shift from just a program that we're all attending to a relationship where I am building my life into another person or two who are then being prepared to carry their life of faith into others in their future. And that really is best captured with the term disciple maker. Disciple maker is one who says, God, I have been so transformed in my life because of your presence. I sense the Holy Spirit working in my conscience and in my, in my thought life and in my emotions. And my desire is to, to give that away to someone else. And the hope is that the, the, the work of God in me through his Holy Spirit is then transferred to another person who will then be able to transfer that faith to yet another person. And so we go from discipleship, that's the relationship between two, to disciple maker, someone deciding I'm going to make that difference. And there is a disciple shift in that we start to really produce people of godly character, of great courage, of great um, grace and love for other people. So what do I do with all that? That's a new understanding for some of us, that it is not about my attending a church and being fed. It's not about my being a part of a program and enjoying the benefits of that program or my being involved in a fellowship with a group of like-minded people that I find enjoyable, though all of those are good. This is about an almost holy mission where people of God who love him dearly say, I am not going through this life alone. I want to be involved in deep, connected relationships. 
where my story is interacting and connecting with other stories and we are helping each other grow where my experience is helping a younger believer grow up into a, a higher level of maturity where we are watching relationships be healed rather than stressed and more toxic it's like God's story is becoming infused into our stories and then our stories are interconnecting and we are then making it a bigger story. And what does that look like? I think there are really three things that describe this work of disciple shift. The first one is a person is transformed. They go from not thinking about the things of God. They have a, a mindset that, that the word calls natural. They think about the things of this earth, the things that they are going through, the problems that they're having, the struggles they're experiencing. And then they meet Jesus and they realize there's something greater, there's something more, and they grab onto that by faith and say, I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. We call that a conversion. In theology is called a justification moment where we choose to surrender our lives to Him and let Him come in and fill us with His presence, his, his spirit, and our forgiveness. That's a wonderful place to be. But there's a second piece of that as well, and that's a kind of transparency. It's one thing to be born again, which is the old language of conversion. It's another entirely to grow in a more into a more spiritual depth of character. And that transparency can best be described as a kind of long, slow growth into a kind of sanctification. That is, I'm growing towards holiness. I, I probably will not get to pure holiness in this earth. But I am growing in my character, in my depth of love, in my tolerance, my patience, all of those things that we describe as being character descriptions of a person of faith. And in growing that way, I usually grow best when I do it with other people. Could be a one-on-one, -on -one, could be a triad relationship between myself and two other people, could be a small group even. But that transparency takes time, it takes study in, in this book, it takes interaction between people of like mind in, in spiritual things, encouraging one another, challenging one another, holding each other accountable, helping each other grow. That second piece of transparency is really a matter of saying, I am not afraid to show you who I am. I'm not afraid to let you know what I, what I believe. These first two elements of being transformed and then transparent are really the life of a believer in Christ, a believer in God. We are experiencing all the great benefits of knowing God. We are experiencing all the great benefits in our spirit, our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions are, are more... Um, disciplined but free we enjoy the life we are living we enjoy that life in a fellowship of other believers but there's a discipleship that takes place as I start to see that I am a part of another person's story that I can step into another person's life come alongside another person and become a disciple maker taking what God has given me the rich gifts that he's given me, the, the understanding, the assurance, the, the assertive nature of my life, the interdependence of things that, that I believe in and interact with people. And I can now start to say, hey, can I help you along this journey as well? Can, can I come along beside you and help you through this rough patch? When I decide that there is another person that I'd like to engage my life with, become a coach too, I become a disciple maker. And, and that could best be described as the third step behind transformation, the second step of transparency into transferred. When I start to pick up another person and get engaged in their life, now I'm really involved in the ministry that the Holy Spirit came to bring to multiply this faith to so many people. It's not a matter of following a strict set of codes or laws. It's more like, by grace, I have discovered something that I want to show you. Come on along, let's find that good life. What we'd like to invite you into then is a process whereby you become the disciple maker. 
You shift from believing and enjoying and fellowship and service into outreach and transformation of another person's life. There's a formula for this. It really involves three pieces. It comes from a series of books called Discipleship. We've rewritten the language of it a bit to come up with these three parts of the formula. I decide that I want to make an intentional connection with a person. That, may, that person may be a complete surprise to me. I might be here at church and some visitor walks in and I start to visit with them and pretty soon we're having a conversation about the things of God and then they make a decision for Christ and I end up baptizing them in Clear Creek right down the road here. That's a wonderful experience. I can never predict how God is going to bring people into my life. But there are also people who sit down the pew from me or up further back or front in the church or there's someone I work with in my job or there's a neighbor across the street. God just puts on my heart and I start to interact with them and I start to build a relationship with them and I start to see, boy, God is really at work in their life and I could be a part of that. I could become a coach to them. That intentional connection is a thing that's, that's directed by the Holy Spirit into our lives and into our conscious thinking about establishing a relationship. The second piece is a relational environment. I start to ask, where's the best way to do this? When I was a teacher, when I was a professor, my thoughts were mostly for my students. I went looking for relationships with these kids. And they might go from a classroom into the lunchroom and we'd start to talk about the things that were on their mind, their heart, and soon that would lead to a deeper relationship and soon that would lead to conversations about the things of God. When I'm interacting with my neighbors, it might be sharing chores around the neighborhood. It might be somebody I'm taking out to coffee on a regular basis once a week. It might be that person who comes to my church and they just seem kind of all alone and by themselves. It might be a young couple and I, I get attached to them and I want to spend the time with them. Holy Spirit is interesting in how he, he crafts those relationships before we ever make connections. So if I have an intentional connection and I found an environment in which to work with that, the third piece then would be a purposeful scheme. For most believers, we do a kind of cafeteria selection of godly learning. We, we do a kind of restaurant selection. I think I'll have a little bit of this or a little bit of that. And we never get the complete meal. We never get the complete package. In, and we never receive it in such a way that we could turn around and pass that package off to someone else so they could learn how to cook the meal, so they could learn how to play the game, so they could learn how to live a good life. So when we, when we find a purposeful scheme, a direction, in which we could take a person from their infancy in Christ to their maturity in Christ and their reproduction into a new generation of believers, that's a powerful tool for us. So let me make this crystal clear. Here's what I'm offering to you. You want a good life? That good life begins with relationships. Those relationships create a story, and that story is really a measure of how God has stepped in to life on earth. He's done it through people. He's done it through their heart. So we said all that to say this. We're, we're inviting you into a process of becoming a disciple maker. Disciple maker who starts an intentional connection, who then works in a relational environment where life can, we can do life together and learn how to, to transact the, the spiritual life into the lives of others. And then we're going to do it with a purposeful scheme. A purposeful scheme <clears throat> is flexible. It's flexible in the sense that I don't have to start at the beginning and go to the end. I may have someone who comes to me, say a student from um, a state clear across the country, and they're quite mature because of the church they grew up in. So I can pick up with them on the scheme and just move ahead and then help them learn how to come back around and reproduce that scheme in the life of someone else. That scheme could be, mean that this person is wrestling with this issue and so we're going to move to this body of material or this person is wanting to learn how to share their faith or study the Bible better and we can move to this material. We have a, a way of building a complete, 
compelling and contagious package uh, of, of material and knowledge and wisdom, but also of character and deep desire to please God. What I get most excited about is that when I start this process, I'm really doing more to multiply the faith than by building a, a multi-mega church with thousands of people. I could have a successful program with 60 people in it and still not be discipling anyone into greater character and growth. But when I start with individuals and I build into them and I watch them grow and then reproduce their faith in others, then I'm really involved in the disciple maker process. And this has the potential to change the world. We're inviting you to join us in that process. Won't you come?